Okay, so we have a solution, right? We proved existence. We know that it's the only possible solution. We have uniqueness. So now we can start talking about the properties of these solutions. Uh, and specifically of interest to us from a course on stability of finite element uh, formulations is the property of, of stability. And this is actually a, somewhat of a, a vague property. What does stability mean? And it's one of the things that uh, you kind of realize uh, that something is unstable when you see something unstable. Uh, but it's, it's kind of difficult to quantify exactly what stability is for cases where you, are, you would say, well, that is stable. Now, we're still at the point where we're talking about just bilinear forms equaling linear forms. So this is still just an arbitrary partial differential equation uh, and still nothing that relates to finite element methods. Right? So this is really just a partial differential equation set in an infinite dimensional Sobolev space and no finite element discretization in sight yet. So somehow we're talking about the stability not of a finite element formulation, but of the partial differential equation itself. Yeah, so somehow there is a, a stability notion of partial differential equations. And if we start thinking about this a little bit, then we kind of intuitively understand that an navier stokes equation is, is maybe not very stable, right? Uh, we talked about navier stokes equations as, as being chaotic. If we change the initial conditions a little bit, then we get different solutions. So that is, that is clearly not something that's very stable. So coming from there, uh, the de definition of stability that we will adhere to is uh, how sensitive my solution is, my solution of my partial differential equation to the given data. And data is, is still uh, somewhat of a vague term. Uh, but data is essentially everything that goes into this right-hand side. This is all data. We saw that we have our forcing function in the right-hand side. We saw that we have our Neumann boundary condition in the right-hand side. And we saw in uh, one of the, the specific videos on that topic that even the Dirichlet data ends up on the right-hand side somehow. So all boundary conditions and body forces. Those are prescribed fields that will change how our solution uh, looks like, what our solution looks like. And stability is now going to be the sensitivity of the solution to the data. So what question do we do we want to answer here? And I, I suppose that the, quant uh, the, the question that we want to answer to, to determine its sensitivity is, is essentially how much does the solution change if we change the data a little bit? So how does, how much does the magnitude of our solution, that's the way that we're going to measure this, the magnitude of u depend on the magnitude of the data. So it's, it's a little strange maybe to talk about the magnitude of the solution and the magnitude of data. But then again, we've already talked about concepts of magnitudes uh, of functions where we have these norms to define them. So the magnitude of u, well, that one we actually had a very explicit definition for. That was the norm of u. And since we're still looking for function u in h10, this would be the h1 norm. So the magnitude of the data, maybe that's something that's uh, more tricky right now. Of the data. Well, what was the data? The data was everything that goes into LW. So the way that we define the magnitude of a linear form is by putting in all possible functions for W and getting the maximum value. 
So uh, for any new uh, function w, this, this l of w was a functional, so it's going to produce a number. And if I choose any particular choice of w, the largest value that I can get out of l, uh, that is going to be the magnitude. Now I would have to normalize this a little bit. Uh, so what I would actually get uh, is, is the following definition. We will take the maximum, but in an infinite dimensional setting, actually, I, I should be careful saying max and min. And so we have this new term called the supremum. The supremum of this normalized L. So I'm going to normalize it by the norm of W. And I'll do this for all functions W in H1, except for the one where W is equal to zero. So except for W is equal to zero, because clearly then we have a zero divided by zero, right? That's uh, ill-defined. So I, I plug in just all kind of different functions for w, except for zero, and the maximum value that I get out of that, that's the supremum, that is going to be cl. That's going to be the magnitude of my data. Now, cl is actually a, a symbol that I already uh, used before uh, for the boundedness of l, and I uh, will actually see that that's precisely what this statement is, uh, because if uh, the supremum the maximum value of this expression is going to be CL. Then for any other function W other than the one that produces that maximum value, we would get smaller than uh, value smaller than or equal to CL. So in general, we have LW divided by the norm of W is going to be smaller than or equal to CL. At max, it's going to be equal to CL, but for other choices of W, it might be smaller. And this has to be true for all w. So now we just multiply both sides by the norm of w, and we actually get lw is smaller than or equal to cl times the norm of w h1 for all w and h1. And that was precisely the, the property of l that we called the boundedness. with this boundedness coefficient CL. And in a previous video, we already kind of talked about that we would expect this, these things to be bounded because we, we don't uh, expect to get infinite values uh, if we plug in some function uh, W. Um, uh, that would clearly lead to problems. Uh, and now we have a more uh, specific notion of this, namely this is actually the magnitude of the data. Okay, so now uh, uh, stability is, is going to be somehow a, a ratio between the, mag the change in magnitude of u and the change in magnitude of the data. So let's try to make that explicit. And this is again pretty much a one-line uh, proof that I think everybody that has an interest in, in our field uh, of computational mechanics uh, should be familiar with. It's, it's just one line. You can memorize this without any problem, but it gives you a very uh, a clear understanding of, of a lot of the mathematics behind this. Uh, it's going to be a statement on the stability of, of the solution. So I'll begin with my, my, my equ the equation that we're solving um, after we found the solution. So we have BU, and I'll plug that into both sides of my bilinear form. So now I have my solution U. And I know that this will be true, because by definition of my, my original statement, we're looking for a solution u such that this has to be true for all possible test functions. So I, I could choose uh, my test function being equal to my solution u, and then I would obtain this statement. And that has to be true as well. Now on the right side, we have L of u, and we have this boundedness property, right? So I can actually make a claim here that we know that this is going to be smaller than CL times the norm of u. But I also had this property uh, of, of coercivity. And that was that b is going to be larger than or equal to something else. Or if I may write this in reverse, then we get a smaller than or equal sign on the left. And the, the statement was that uh, c, the coercivity constant, times the norm of u square, again measured in h1, it's going to be smaller than or equal to b, or, or the original statement said this the other way around, right? Uh, b, uh, u, u is going to be larger than or equal to cc, 
uh, times the norm of u. But that's obviously the same one. Yeah? So now we have here all the way on the, the left something that is going to be smaller than a chain, which is going to be smaller than something all the way on the right. Yeah? So if I now plug these ones next to each other, then uh, what we have is that the cc times the norm of u measured in h1 cent square is going to be smaller than or equal to a cl times the norm of u in h1. So I can divide both sides by the norm of u. I can divide both sides by cc. And then the statement that I'll get is that the norm of u measured in h1 sense is going to be smaller than cl divided by cc. So what does this say? Well, we have here the magnitude of the solution. We have here the magnitude of the data. And our original quest was to find a relation between the magnitude of our solution u and the magnitude of the data. And that is precisely what this relation is saying. So we have here that the magnitude of our solution is going to be bound from above by the magnitude of the data uh, divided by cc. And that was the corrosivity constant. Again, this was sort of a, a smallest eigenvalue of our stiffness matrix. But right now, we're not talking about 500 stiffness matrices. This is still in this infinite dimensional sublef space context, pure partial differential equations. So this is, from that perspective, this becomes now a stability uh, coefficient. So the coercivity constant of our bilinear form, which in a finite element sense is the minimal eigenvalue of the stiffness matrix, uh, that says something about how sensitive my solution is to the data. If I have a very small value for CC, then a small change in data, a small change in CL, is going to produce a potentially very different solution U. And if I have a very large uh, CC, so something very large on the bottom of my fraction, then a small change in CL is not going to have a, a, a big change, is not going to cause a big change in U. So this is a stability relationship. And again, this has nothing to do with numerics. This is something that is baked into the partial differential equation. So partial differential equations have a very natural stability and notion to them, uh, the sensitivity of the solution to the data. And this is going to be important to us because clearly if we're dealing with a very sensitive, unstable partial differential equation, then it's going to be uh, challenging to obtain a stable finite element uh, solution. Uh, so this is something that we'll, we'll at least have to, to be aware of, uh, we might use in the future. And the, I think the, the key thing here that I want to get across is that that coercivity constant again shows up. Coercivity is going to be very important for us. And in this case, it shows up as a stability measure of our partial differential equation. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your attention.